Hey y'all, welcome and welcome back to my channel. It's me, Kia Simone. And we gotta get into this last installment of the Real Housewives of Potomac reunion. But before we do that, I wanted to address a few things. First things first, I took special exception to being called a colorist or a person who upholds colorism in my comments. I'm not gonna play that game. I drag everybody. I hold everybody accountable. But when it comes around to Candace or Wendy, or when I question something that Candace or Wendy says, all of a sudden I'm a colorist? First of all, let me be very clear that it's not an issue of me not understanding colorism, the impacts of colorism, who benefits from colorism, the people who are blind to their benefits of colorism. My issue is holding everybody accountable. Yes, there is colorism that happens on this show. I've addressed it, I've said it, but because there is colorism that happens on this show, that does not exempt the darker women from being held accountable for the things that they do and say. Now, I'm not here to defend Robin or Giselle or colorism or Bravo or Real Housewives of Potomac because I have said a long time ago that Bravo, the whole network in and of itself, is playing in black people's faces. I have said that a long time ago. I call Giselle, Robin, Candace, Wendy, Karen, any damn body else they put on this show. I've called them all on their bullshit. But what y'all not going to do is call me a motherfucking colorist for continuing to call everybody on their bullshit. I'm not about to go through, oh, my mother's a dark-skinned woman and quantifying all of my experiences as a black woman or all of the things that have been done to me. I'm not going through that. Nor am I going to subscribe to that bullshit selective outrage because the same people who had so much to say about me being a colorist and me being problematic are the same people who overlooked Candace on the exact same episode making comments about Mia's child's dark skin. They are the same people who had nothing to say about Candace going to the internet expressing her fear of having light-skinned children while she's married to a white man who has light-skinned children, some of whom he was absent from their lives for years on end. Like, miss me. And then, when I won't allow you to just call me whatever you think you gonna call me, when I won't back down from what I believe, because this is my opinion, when I will stand behind what I've said and what I believe, here come the, well, I'm unfollow, and I already unfollow her. I don't even be watching her. Then how are you in my comments? I'm going to tell you right now, going forward, when you come in my comments with the whole announcing you're going to unfollow, I'm going to help you and I'm going to block you. To come in my comments and tell me, I can call you whatever I want to call you. I can say whatever I want to say. You a damn lie. I will not be disrespected because you don't know how to have a difference of opinion. I'm not dealing with that. And that brings me to weaponized support. Now, I think a lot of people mistake my kindness for weakness, my love for stupidity, and my gratitude for desperation. The fact that I am grateful for every subscriber I have, the fact that I'm grateful for every bit of support that I get does not mean that I will lay down to have it. It does not mean that I will sell my soul and let you run over me and say anything about me and manipulate my opinion and make me say what you want me to say so that I can keep your subscription. Baby, if I was going to sell my soul, it would have been to a man with a lot of money a long time ago. But for the few of you that do not understand, I'm going to tell you the same thing I've had to tell several men. My soul nor my S is for sale, okay? So while I love y'all, I appreciate y'all, I am very grateful for y'all. I won't be disrespected. I won't be talked to all kind of ways. I won't be called outside my name. I won't be accused of all kind of bullshit under the guise of fake outrage. I'm not dealing with it. So if you think you're going to come in my comments and disrespect me, I'm not going to block your ass. You, you didn't think long enough. Now to address the range comment that Wendy still has not cleared up. Now, everybody came in my comments. Well, well we assume what I took from what she said. All of those are your interpretations and assumptions, just like my opinion is my interpretation and assumption based on what she said and what she did not say. Wendy is an experienced political commentator. Even if she was in a position where she felt like these people don't care, that's the crux of the job she's had for years. She has been put into spaces where she uses her education and experience to express her position on whatever the matter is, even when she is surrounded by people who do not agree with her. Now, speaking of range, because there were several comments about, well, you have to have a certain level of education to talk about it. First of all, I absolutely respect Wendy's education and Wendy's accomplishments. 
However, you are not going to tell me that someone's education trumps generational Black Americans' experience. Because if that were the case, a random man from Australia could go get multiple degrees in African American studies and tell you that they are more qualified to speak on your experience and your issues than you are. Now that's not to say that Wendy doesn't have the right or relevant experience to speak to colorism, but who is she to tell the other women that they don't have the right or relevant experience to speak to colorism. They are generationally black American women. So even if they have benefited from colorism, which several of them have, they are still qualified to participate in the conversation. The thing is, while Wendy is a dark skinned black woman, Wendy does not have any connection to being generationally black American. Chattel slavery and everything that came with it is not a part of her history. Cause let's talk about where colorism really, really comes from. Now it happens in every culture of people of color. However, colorism for black Americans is a construct of racism, slavery, and Willie motherfucking Lynch. Willie Lynch wrote letters to all of the slave masters telling them to divide us by color. And if you divide them by color, you will have them fighting amongst themselves for hundreds of years to come. And we prove him right every day. This is something that roots back to slavery for black Americans. Now, I respect Wendy and her family, but it is a different thing to be a child of immigration, a child of a family that chose to come here, that benefits from the fight that generationally black American people have fought for many years on end. So to say that women who have come from backgrounds of chattel slavery, fighting for freedom, Jim Crow and segregation, civil rights era, to tell people who have generationally fought through those things that they don't have the range to have a particular conversation. Who are you to make that decision? Who are you to dictate that? And I get that Wendy has studied political science. I get that Wendy may have studied African-American history, but it is a different thing to have generationally experienced what it is to be black in America. So if range is the issue, understand that range is not limited to having a formal education on a particular topic. And granted, she's a doctor and I respect all that, but being a doctor or being educated does not mean that you're smarter than everybody in the room. Hell, doctors out here unaliving people every damn day misdiagnosing people every damn day. So to use the fact that you have a certain level of education or professional experience to try to silence other people, I'm, I'm not going for that. Especially when you won't have the conversation because if you do believe that you have the right to dictate that these people do not have the range to have the conversation, that indicates to me that you believe that you do. So if you do have the range to have the conversation, have the conversation. So I said all that to say, I said what I said and it is what it is. I am so sorry if you do not like it or if you do not agree, I'm gonna stand up for what I believe in. So now that I've gotten that off my chest, let's go ahead and get into the review. Now, before we get into it, yes, I have heard that Candace and Chris are finally expecting. Congratulations to them. I heard that Wendy's house was broken into. I'm so sorry to hear that. I heard that Robin got fired. Good riddance. I truly do not give a so part three of the reunion opens up with Gordon's announcement, which is that he has bipolar one and that is why he has been acting the way that he's been acting. He said he was just diagnosed two and a half years ago, but he can trace the condition back to as early as his late twenties. He said that what he also realizes is that his mania got worse over the years as he gained more control, more power, and more money. Gordon said that he has come to a place where he's accepted his diagnosis. He recognizes what needs to be done to manage the issue, he says that he understands that yes, he does need to take his medication, but he realizes that medication is not the end all be all, that he has to be aware of and in control of to some degree, his behaviors. He said that other people around him can see when he's going into a manic episode, but of course he cannot. He ended up explaining that him reaching out to all of the husbands to drag Mia from here to hell was a result of him being in a manic episode. So since he admitted that, Andy asked him, well, when you locked Mia in a room and took her phone, was that a manic episode as well? And he's confused by locked her in a room. Now, I remember I took her phone. 
Mia said, you locked me in the room and you took my phone. Gordon said, well, I mean, I do remember taking her phone. I don't quite remember locking her in a room. He said, but that's another marker of a manic episode that you don't quite remember everything that happens during a manic episode. And now listen, I totally understand mental health. And this is not in any way to take a dig at Gordon or the issue of having bipolar disorder. However, I can understand Mia deciding that I will love you from afar. I will be here for you. I will look out for you. I will make sure that you are taken care of to the best of my ability because I can accept that you have a diagnosis. I can accept that this is an issue that you're battling. But to me, that's a little bit scary simply because you're a man who can overpower this woman, right? And if in a manic episode, you've already had a behavior of locking her into rooms and taking her source of communication, taking her source of reaching out for help, taking her money so that she cannot provide for herself or her children, what else will you do and just not really remember? He says, I remember taking her phone, but I don't remember all that rumple still by locking her in a room and all kinds of shit, I don't know. So then Andy asked Gordon, do you believe that Mia has had an affair during your marriage. He said, during the marriage, yes. For the duration of the marriage, no. And Gordon goes on to say that he believes that if he had gotten help for his bipolar or for his mania at some point earlier in the marriage or earlier in his life, that he and Mia would still be together. He said, I don't think that she left me because she doesn't want to be with me or because she wants to be with somebody else. I think she left me because she can't take the behavior anymore. And that's actually very telling. Now, 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 Mia, Mia is still messy as hell. All that bunch of messing with somebody's husband or being somebody's wife while you messing with this man, it's a mess. But it does make sense as to why she don't wanna be with him. I get not wanting to be held hostage to a marriage when somebody does not want to get help. And I get that he has now gotten help. And while it might be at the right time for his life, it might be too late for his marriage. Gordon goes on to say that even though he and me are separated, they're not together, she's living her own life, she's still been there for him. He said that things got so bad for him that he had to check himself into a hospital. And the next morning she was there and she was there every day with the exception of one day making sure that he was okay. So Andy goes on to ask Gordon, what is the state of his relationship with his family now? Because he was suing everybody there and kicked him out the company and everything else. And he said it's 100% better because he now realizes that when they voted him out of his CEO position, it was because he was in a phase of mania. So we move on and we get into the NECA segment. They start her segment with asking about her pregnancy and fertility journey. She said the IUI was unsuccessful, so she's moved on to IVF. She said Candace, who is now having a baby, shared a lot of information and resources with her, so she was really grateful for that. So then they get into the zip code wars about whether NECA lives in Potomac, North Potomac. Child, I don't give a damn. Karen up there carrying on about, I just thought it needed to be pointed out that she does not live in Potomac. Like, get over it. Who gives a damn where you live as long as you live within your means? So they move on to the NECA versus Wendy, the whole submitting names to shrine segment. And Andy starts out by saying that they're aware that it's a very culturally sensitive conversation that they wish that they did not have to have, but it was brought up on the show. He said production was not made aware of whatever this concern was about a name being submitted to a shrine and voodoo being all kind of bullshit. They didn't know nothing about that. Andy said it was casting that wanted to bring NECA on with Wendy because they had mutual friends and they thought it would be a good idea. Well, Wendy corrected by saying that production casting, whoever came to her and asked her, do you know X, Y, and Z? She didn't say any names. She just said X, Y, and Z. She said, she told them, no, I don't know X, Y, and Z. And their response was, well, that's funny because they said that they know you. So Wendy says, when they said that to her, she wasn't excited and it's not because she didn't want her on the show. It was because in her Mariah Carey voice, I don't know her. So NECA speaks up to say that I told production that I've met Wendy and I've had a conversation with Wendy because I have. Wendy said, oh, so you did say that you know me. NECA said, do you listen or do you just talk a lot? Wendy responds with, oh, are you angry? That's the game I do not like. Wendy literally avoids conversations. She rather pick these fights and go back and forth about emotions than to have a conversation about what the subject at hand is. 
So now that NECA is frustrated because Wendy plays this game. I don't care what anybody says. Wendy asked her, why are you angry? Why are you being hostile to me? I haven't been hostile to you at all. Now this is the same Wendy that talked about trigger words with black women. NECA said, you've been sitting here lying all day. That is hostile behavior. So NECA explains the event at which she and Wendy met. Andy explains to Wendy that, listen, for production, Sometimes when we're aware that people have met each other, that they've been around each other, that they might know each other, we use that to our advantage. Wendy said, I wasn't saying anything. I wasn't shading. I was just saying, I don't know her. But she literally spent this season saying how this woman came on this show to ride her coattails. But NECA cleared that up. NECA said, married to medicine, actually reached out to her husband first because her husband is a doctor. They reached out to her husband and then reached out to her about being on the show. She said her husband's cousin, Lebe, who is also Wendy's friend, who was at Wendy's daughter's christening or whatever the ceremony was, is who wanted to introduce the two of them. She is the one who said, hey, I have a fellow Nigerian Igbo sister who's in the DMV and y'all have to meet. So the next question that Andy asked is when NECA first met up with Ashley, Ashley brought up, Wendy being Osu. So he asked, what does it mean to be Osu? Wendy turned around and said, well, Ashley, since you brought it up, since you brought it to this platform, what does it mean to be Osu? Neka starts to respond and Wendy jumps in to tell her, no, you can't answer. Let Ashley answer. So, so once again, you're going to refuse to answer a question, refuse to have a conversation, and then dictate who can have the conversation. Okay, because the awareness that Ashley brought it to this platform has been there from the very beginning. For some reason, Wendy didn't say a word to Ashley the entire season, which is also what happened last season when Ashley was the bone carrier that came to Wendy and told her, yeah, they said X, Y, and Z about your husband. And Wendy just jumped off the deep end and cursed everybody out. Well, Ashley called out as normal. That's what Ashley does. Ashley said, listen, I've never misrepresented that I know what Osu means. I do understand that it's culturally sensitive, but I've never said that I know what it is or what it means. So Andy asked, well, what was your intention in bringing it up to NECA? And Candace said, why not bring it up to Wendy? Well, her intention was to start she, like she always does. And what drives me up a wall is they let her. They let Ashley start all kinds of shit all the time. Ashley brings people on this show who will literally fight and everybody just overlooks Ashley. And what I've said from the beginning of the season is I feel like when Ashley brought that bullshit to Wendy, Wendy should have given Ashley her entire esticus. Do not come to me with that bullshit about my Nigerian sister. Ashley said it was something that was brought to her attention and that's why she brought it up to NECA. Well, NECA finally spoke up to say that she doesn't feel like any of them are quite competent to explain or discuss what Osu is. So Giselle asked, well, is it a bad thing? And her husband spoke up to say, it is a taboo thing. It is not something that we discuss. And Wendy followed up to say it is very taboo. It is something that we do not talk about. It should have never been brought to this platform. And she didn't want to hear anything else from Ashley on the matter because if she understood just how sensitive it was, she would eat it and shut up. Ashley said, and I have, I have done that, but what I will not fall on the sword for is what followed that subsequently. Y'all fighting amongst yourselves? Now, here's the problem. Ashley is an agent of chaos. Ashley did go plant the seed. The problem is the reason the seed was able to take root and bloom is because Wendy already had whatever issues she had internally with NECA and feeling like NECA was coming on her show or coming for her spot. I feel like Ashley should have been shut down at every turn from the very beginning. So Andy asked Wendy, he said, NECA has apologized for calling your mom a witch. What else do you need from her to move on? She said, I don't need anything from her. I mean, we can coexist and that's it. And she just needs to take accountability and move forward. NECA said, you're the one that can't take accountability. I've apologized for everything that Andy just stated. NECA went on to say, you know, I was really excited to come on this show and share space with another Nigerian Igbo sister. I was very excited about that, but I was attacked by her in a number of ways. She said beyond the phone calls, 
Wendy was in the group spreading all the rumors about me and the Osu thing. She said the Osu thing never had anything to do with me. She said she never had any energy for Ashley this entire season when Ashley is the one who brought it to the platform and perpetuated it. But she had all the smoke for me and tried to ice me out when I had nothing to do with it. As a matter of fact, NECA was on record saying when Ashley asked her about Wendy being Osu, she said, I don't know nothing about them being Osu. I know that's something you don't want to be, but I don't know anything about her and her family being Osu. Now, of course, when NECA brings that up, Wendy just sits there with that smile and says nothing because she's right. And one thing Wendy is not going to do is have the hard conversation, period. So my question becomes, why is it that Wendy will go off on anybody but Ashley? I, I do not understand that. So Mia asks, well, will y'all ever be friends? You can see NECA shaking her head. No, Wendy said, I said what I said, we can coexist. So they move on, they send the husbands away and they bring Kiana, AKA K out, the one who ended up having to whoop Deborah's. So they start the conversation with Kay's path to getting on the show. She said she met Wendy, I guess about five years ago. They had a mutual friend. She is also friends with Giselle's hairstylist, Cal. So Andy goes on to ask Kay, who else did she find herself getting close to throughout the season? She said she absolutely loves Candace, Karen, Robin, and Giselle. So speaking of who she was friends with and that she came on the show through Wendy, the first viewer question to her was, it does look like Wendy brought Kay on the show and left her for dead. Because it's your friend's first cast trip and you don't even go check on her when she's sick. And they show a clip from that trip where Kiana is running to the bathroom sick. And while she's running to the bathroom sick, Wendy is walking around the grounds of where they're staying and they're asking about who's going to be sharing a room. And Wendy said, I'm not sharing a room with Kiana. Like, what? So is you friends with anybody? And the next viewer question was, why did Wendy so emphatically say she was not sharing a room with Kiana? And Wendy answers with, well, nobody else had to share rooms. We all had our own room. So why would I be sharing a room? Well, Robin and Giselle are off to the side having a conversation saying that's not how that happened. At the point that she said she's not sharing a room with Kiana, we didn't know that we had enough space for everybody to have their own rooms. So Andy asked Kiana, did it bother you when you saw that? She said, actually it did. And that's why she really appreciated Giselle because Giselle was the only one to come check on her on the trip and say, hey girl, are you okay? She said, and that's when it registered to her that nobody came to check on her. Candace's response was that Giselle Checking on Kiana was strategic. How does she strategize nobody else checking on the girl? She said that wasn't about Kiana. It was about making Candace and Wendy look like bad friends. How could she make y'all look like bad friends? You made the choice to not show up for your friend. And Giselle spoke up to say, I don't appreciate that. I went and checked on the girl to check on the girl to say I went and checked on her to be strategic is ridiculous. So they move on to get into Wendy's YouTube talk show about whether it's doing well. She said it is doing well, but it's more work. It's harder than she thought it would be. And Wendy went on to ask if she decided to change directions with her talk show because in her pilot, she had guests on the show. It was kind of like a round table discussion, I guess. He said, and now it's more of a monologue to camera where it's just her. She said what that comes down to is she doesn't have the capacity to be able to book people for every episode. And she didn't want her show to be contingent on being able to book guests. So Andy went on to get into asking Wendy about Eddie being in the green tree business. She said that he's doing very well. Yes, they do get to partake of the product. And Andy asked, well, what does your very religious mom think of Eddie being in the weed business? She said, well, yes, my mom is very religious, but she's also very Nigerian. So as long as he has his degrees and he's accomplished, she doesn't really care. As long as his endeavors don't risk his life or the life of others. So essentially your mother is religious, but she will put her religion aside when there's a bag involved. Okay. So the next question was about Wendy and her endeavor hopping. They say you came on saying you were a doctor and a professor. Next thing we know, you were trying to sell home goods. Now you selling weed and trying to sell a talk show. Like pick something and sit down. She said she still has her home essentials business. They're still shipping out orders. She says she is still teaching, but she thinks that this will be her last year because her daughter is turning five. She's going to kindergarten and she has missed out on a lot of special moments with her children and she doesn't want to miss out on them anymore. So then Andy moves into the segment to discuss Wendy calling Mia slow. And of course they showed the clip when they were starting this segment where they were having this roundtable discussion 
And Wendy is saying that her talk show is very high vibrational. And so if you're not on a certain intellectual level, you won't be able to understand it. And Mia said, well, if you are so high vibrational, why are you so quick to call people slow? Wendy said, because you are slow. And then we saw Mia having a conversation with Karen where she was expressing that she does have a child who has either special needs or received special education. And that is a trigger word. It's not something that you say. The viewer question or observation was, Wendy, I think it's cruel for you to call me a slow, especially as an educator and someone who speaks so much about female empowerment. And Wendy defended it by saying that, Mia is the same person that said living in Maryland and North Carolina was bi-coastal. So Mia said, I just think that we need to be mindful of buzzwords. Just like Wendy was saying, it's not okay to call black women aggressive last season. So the next viewer question to Wendy was, Wendy, you say that you hold yourself and others to high standards, but you can go just as low as anybody else on the cast. For example, calling Mia slow and calling NECA a crackhead. Why say that? Wendy explained that the crackhead comment was in response and reaction to the constant commentary about her mother being a witch, but she does take accountability and she does apologize for that. Mia said she also called me a pathological liar. Now, now, Mia is a pathological liar. And Wendy said, well, Mia, you do be lying. But, but didn't they also catch Wendy telling flat out lies in the beginning of last season? Or are they not all liars? So they move on to Ashley and get into her segment. They start out with talking about her dating life, she said that she does have a friend, but he is a man who does not want to get married. He does not have children. So she thinks that they are just having fun. So Andy asked Ashley, does she want to get married again? She said, yes, yeah, she does want to get married again and she will get married again. So Andy brought up that there is a lot of speculation that her divorce is not real, that it's only for the show. Ashley said, well, first of all, what it is, is people have only seen a fraction of what Michael and I have been through or we go through on this show. So Robin pipes up to ask, well, what was the holdup? What was the delay in you filing for divorce? I guess the same reason you delayed filing divorce for Mark. Ashley said it was just very contentious. Robin said, so essentially it was easier for y'all to coexist the way that you were. Ashley says she came to realize that they were in a toxic cycle where they would get along well, everything is going great. And then they hit a roadblock, everything goes left. She said while they were filming the season, she and Michael were in a toxic place. When the show wrapped filming, they were in a much better place. And then they descended back into toxicity. And that's when she realized that some people just have narcissistic personalities and she is deciding to separate herself. She said that she's actually gone ahead and filed the necessary paperwork to get her divorce process started. So, so essentially y'all weren't getting a divorce all this time. Y'all were together. Y'all were in this toxic cycle doing what y'all do. And now you going to file for divorce, girl child. So Andy brought up that it was brought to their attention that Ashley and Michael still share a credit card that she uses for the children's expenses for Uber Eats. And he asked that she use the card for anything else. She said, no, not really. And Wendy piped up to say, well, didn't you put these on the card? She said she absolutely did use the card to get her some new boobs. Well, I guess since the kids used up the last set of boobs she had that justified her putting them on the credit card that they used for the kids. I don't know, child. And Andy goes on to ask Ashley how much money she is looking to secure in the divorce. And all she said is a sizable amount. Girl, good luck. And when Ashley says she's looking to secure a sizable amount in her divorce, Wendy said, you should, you deserve it. I'm trying to figure out why Wendy is so supportive of Ashley, who has been at the root of every beef she's had on this show. I do not understand. So Nekka piped up to ask, well, even if you got a divorce and you financially needed him, he would still be there for you, right? Ashley said the jury's still out on that. And that part of the deal of getting his financial support might be him maintaining ownership of her. So the next viewer question to Ashley was, do you really think that what Mia said in the Dominican Republic was unfair? Because she asked if Ashley married Michael for his money. And the viewer goes on to say, you might not have married him for his money, but you're certainly staying with him for his money. Ashley said the way it went down is that when she met Michael, she was pursuing a career. She had graduated school 
school and she was looking to be a broadcast journalist or a news anchor or something. And she said, Michael told her that he wanted to be with her. He wanted to travel the world. But if she has a nine to five, they can't do that. She said, so she gave that nine to five up. Y'all can have this to greet them jobs and all that shit. I'm going to run off with this man. And of course, over time, she got comfortable and eventually dependent. Let me tell you something I believe in, I live by, I stand by. A man is not a financial plan. Have a plan for your own life. Because if you do see a man as a financial plan, understand that as long as that man is the source of your financial stability, you will be bound to him. That means that that man has a level of power and control over you that you don't even have over yourself. Something my grandmother used to say, something she told my mama that my mama told me, is you never let what a man brings to the table be the only morsel of food you have to put in your mouth always look out for you, always have your own. And I guess thinking about traveling the world and him taking care of her, her being his dependent, just brought back memories. She said, you know, I, I love this man and I massage his feet every night. And you know, they said massage his feet every night. You, you still massaging his damn feet? She tried to clean it up and say, I said it past tense. There's a D on the end. I massaged his feet every night. You was a damn lie. You massage up his feet every damn night. Don't play with us. So Andy goes on to bring up Giselle and Ashley and that trashy clothing line. So since they brought up Giselle and Ashley's clothing line, Andy brought up the swooping that happened at the show. Andy starts by asking Kiana, since she was the one who ended up having to dish out an ass whooping, what was the series of events that led to her being injured? Kiana starts by explaining that she was essentially just trying to de-escalate the whole situation and Deborah clearly came with an agenda to start some shit and try to have a moment. She said, and before she was trying to de-escalate it, Wendy was trying to de-escalate it. But I think she was saying Deborah didn't realize that she was in Kiana's personal space. But all in all, the whole incident, Deborah's approach was direct and aggressive. So Andy goes on to say that production had just stopped filming moments before this happened. So some third party caught it on their camera and it made it to TMZ and that's how the world saw it. He said, now we saw in that video, you throwing punches after Deborah threw a drink on you. So what was going on there? You just said what was going on there. The, she threw a drink on her and she threw a fist back. What? She said, at that moment, I was assaulted. Someone threw a glass at my head and split my face open. What What do you mean? What was going on? She said, and my first instinct was to fight back. You whoop her ass. So then Andy asked Candace, leading up to the fight, was it that you were calling Deborah names and she reacted to that or did it come out of nowhere? What? This is the bullshit. You're trying to use Candace or make Candace wrong in order to justify the shit that Deborah did. And Deborah was dead wrong from beginning to end from top to bottom. Candace said it came from out of nowhere. We were minding our business, having a good time, eating our shrimp, laughing and talking. And she came, got right in my face with some bullshit about, do you have something to say to me? And in response, I called her all them damn names. I called her and I meant it. And Mia spoke up to say Deborah was on a rampage that night. She said, because before she started with Candace, she came and tried to start with me. Because apparently Mia said at some point in the confessional that Deborah ain't all that damn cute. On the scale of bad, she's about a four. She said, and Deborah came to her and got in her face about so I'm only a four Mia I'm only a four she said I just wouldn't feed that damn monster Mia goes on to say that what she did say to Deborah in response to her oh so I'm just a four is no girl we all black queens we're all tens she said and I did that to squash it she said I had I told her yeah you are a four she'd have probably thrown the drink at me but I did what I did because sometimes when you have more to lose you have to be careful about who you allow to engage you so Andy goes on to ask Giselle what she thought of the whole moment. She said, looking at the footage, she thinks that everyone is responsible. They said, who do you mean by everyone? She said, Deborah, Candace, Wendy, and Kay. Are you nuts? Wendy said, how am I responsible? What did I do? And she finally backed up and said, well, I'll take Wendy out. How does Wendy, Kay, or Candace get in the responsibility for it happening to begin with? This was some shit that Ashley... And Deborah did. Now, for me, in my opinion, 
This is where the colorism conversation surfaces to the top. Because what other excuse do you have for why you would hold these three women accountable for them being attacked? Why would you not hold Ashley, who brought this crazy bitch into the circle, and the crazy bitch herself accountable? So then Karen pipes up to ask, why and at what point? Did Candace start referring to Deborah as Berman and all the other names she was calling her? She said it was after she walked her ass up in my face and started picking a fight with me about, do you have something you want to say to me? That's the point at which I said, come get this Berman out of my face. And Mia said, but you can't do that. Candace said, yes, I can. Candace said, you can't tell me how to respond to somebody who's already approached me being disrespectful to me. Mia said, and maybe that's why she threw the drink, girl child. Now, here's my thing. The thing about me is I can be passionate aggressive I can be directly aggressive I can be the kindest person you want to meet I can also be very very mean I can be nice nasty and outright nasty my thing is you walk up on me saying some stupid sh I'm gonna give you stupid sh back you play stupid games you win stupid prizes you don't go running up on somebody that you got something to say to me and when they start saying to you, now you want to fight. So to some degree, I understand that you're not going to walk up on me. You're not going to run up on me and say all kind of stupid shit. And I'm supposed to, could you please, please leave me alone? No, get the fuck out my face. You running up on somebody and trying to pick a fight and them saying something back to you that you do not like does not constitute grounds for you to throw some shit. So I do understand snapping on somebody and using your words as a weapon when they come trying to pick a fight with you. I do also understand that when you do choose to engage, when you do choose to give them what they're looking for, you might also be choosing to participate in escalation of the event. So Andy goes on to ask Candace, do you really think you would have swung that champagne bottle at her? Hell Yes. If someone approaches you in a threatening manner, when they approach you and you talk sh back to them after they talk sh to you, they decide to throw a drink. Why are you questioning the person who the drink was thrown at to say, would you have really reacted by throwing a bottle? Hell yeah. Yeah. If you run up on me, you decide you want to pick a fight with me, you throw sh at me. Anything that's in my vicinity is going upside your head. So Andy goes on to ask Ashley if she still blames Candace, as she said, for using her words. If she feels like Candace's words were still contributory to this event happening. He asked, why do you feel like Candace's mouth was an issue that night? Candace said, because it's always my fault. Ashley said, well, because words play a factor. Ashley said, but I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm not attributing that incident to you, but your words instigated it and made it more explosive. Candace says she disagrees because she feels like Deborah was going to do what she did, whether she said nothing or whether she threatened to kick her ass. So most of the group is saying they disagree and you don't know that, that's not true. So NECA piped up to ask, well, if you're saying that when she came at you, she was already aggressive, do you feel like your words or choice of words might have exacerbated her anger? Candace said, I said no. Candace said what she feels like is that was Deborah's intention, period. She came with the intention to fight her. And Candace starts to cry and says that, you know, here we are again, where people are being justified for violence against me and their actions and their attempt to attack me is somehow trumped by my words. So everyone is telling her that no, they're not saying that their actions trump your words. The point that they're trying to make is that your words played a part. Andy says, well, what they're saying is you are playing with a loaded gun. And she said, well, I'm also a loaded gun too. He said, yeah, but with your words. Here's the thing. Sometimes people do just want a problem with you. Sometimes people are committed to not liking you, to having an issue with you, to having beef with you, to having a brawl with you. I have been in situations where people have actually befriended me. I had a girl that went out of her way to befriend me, knowing that she did not like me, picked a fight with me and bit me in my face. I did not want to fight this girl, but she was dead set on fighting me because of whatever she had in her heart about me. 
And no matter what I did, she was not going to miss her opportunity to fight. Now, Candace is not my cup of tea. I don't really like it. Candace does run off at her mouth a lot of the times. Candace called herself after the whole thing went down with Monique in the very next season or two seasons later. They're off on some vacation and she picks up a handful of lettuce and throws it at Mia like she wants to fight. So I understand that Candace does have an instigative quality about her. She has something about her that will run you up a wall. However, there are times when there are people who are committed to having an issue with you and this is one of those times. Deborah was committed to having an issue with Candace. And I don't understand why there are more questions for Candace about her reaction than there are for Deborah for her actions. So Andy goes on to ask Ashley, did you bring Deborah around to be a starter because she only seemed to come around last season to drop bombs about people's husbands? And Ashley starts her speech about, no, everybody thinks that because that is the truth. She absolutely brought Deborah around to be a starter. Deborah was supposed to come in and do Ashley's dirty work so that Ashley could get these just got and still keep her job. So Ashley starts explaining that Deborah told her that she wanted to clear the air with Candace. And Kiana said that was not clear the air energy. This is a bunch of bullshit. Candace said, and you believed her? Ashley said, well, what else do I have to go on? I mean, a lot of time has passed. I don't know Deborah to be a violent person. Well, now you do. And you can tell from her online shenanigans, she did not want to clear the air she wanted to confront. Ashley goes on to say she didn't invite Deborah to get under anybody's skin. She was a close friend of hers and she just wanted her to come and celebrate in the night with her. And then she says to Kiana that she is very apologetic that Kiana had to go through that. Andy asked Kiana, do you accept that? She sat there for a second and said, you know, Ashley is the queen of aftermath apologies and I'll be damned if she ain't. She said, but I do accept that you were big enough to at least extend an apology and that's all I have to say about that. Ashley said, but how can I apologize in anything but the aftermath? I can't apologize while it's going on. Kiana said, the point is that you're not proactive in general. Basically, you bring people, you start, and then you play dumb. So Andy asked Kiana if she had anything else that she wanted to say before she left the stage. And she did want to say thank you to Karen. She said because Karen was there for her like a mom in that moment. She said she felt alone. She was scared. She was embarrassed. She takes herself very seriously. She's not a violent person. She's never been in a fisticuffs battle. So this was uncharted territory to her. And the only person who would have been there for her like Karen was is her mother. So she thanked Karen for being there for her in that moment. Moment. And Karen, of course, you know, said, I would absolutely be there for you and anybody else in this group, even Robin, in that kind of a situation. Now, now, I don't know, maybe she learned from the whole Candace Monique situation because she was absolutely coddling Monique after that whole thing happened, but that's a whole nother story. Kiana went on to say that she wanted to thank all of the ladies for being receptive and kind to her, for saying kind things to and about her, because she just came there to make friends and have fun with the ladies. She said she laughs and kikis with Robin through text all the time. She said she hadn't heard from Giselle after the event, which surprised her. And they were like, well, are you surprised? We told you it was strategic. Giselle said, listen, when I left that event, I went to be with my father who had brain surgery and then subsequently passed away. She said, so no shade to you, but you just were not on my mind. Kiana said, I mean, but I reached out to you. Giselle said, and did we not talk? She said, yeah, we talked, but it was just the aftermath and that hurt. And on the flip side of the coin, I also get Kiana's feelings being hurt. I get her feeling neglected or like you don't care that I just this girl jumped on me bust my damn face open at your event and I didn't even hear from you so I do get her feeling the way that she feels but I also get Giselle being preoccupied by her dying father so they wrap up this segment and they move to end the reunion Andy extends them the opportunity to extend any apologies that they want to extend to anybody so nobody had anything to say he asked Robin and Candace what about y'all Robin said you know I don't have any anger she said when you've had a friendship the kind of friendship that we've had things like this can't be resolved in one sitting but I don't have any animosity I don't have any anger 
anger or resentment. Candace said, I can say the same thing. She said that she has mourned the friendship over the course of this season and she's just kind of in a neutral place. NECA and Wendy are apparently at an impasse and Andy said when it come to Giselle and Candace, he ain't even gonna try. So they end the reunion by bringing out some pies. I don't know what the hell the pie is supposed to represent and crowning Andy the Duke of Potomac child. I don't give a damn. All I know is I'm glad it's over and I probably won't be back. So cheers to the end. But that's it. That's all and I ain't got no more. Thank you so much for coming down here listening to me and letting me get it off my chest. Please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you've not already. And in the meantime, until next time, just like every time, I love you and I mean it. Bye.